everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Carolina and I'm a sophomore at Tufts and on the board of the Tufts Middle East Research Group. Thank you so much for joining this exciting panel as we close out the week and the end of the Tufts spring semester. Today's panel is hosted by the Tufts Middle East Research Group, a collaborative research group studying the Middle East and North Africa. We are part of the Tufts Institute for Global Leadership. Today's panel features activists and academics who will speak about the various legal, political, and economic dimensions of the Western Sahara conflict. The conflict has largely been defined by Morocco's relationship with neighboring countries and international actors, yet has also long been ignored or overlooked. We are joined today by Professor Stephen Zunes. Stephen Zunes is a professor of politics at the University of San Francisco. He's the co-author of Western Sahara, War, Nationalism, and Conflict Resolution. Hurst Hannum is a professor, professor emeritus of international law at the Fletcher School. His focus is on human rights and its role in the international legal and political order, including in particular issues of self-determination, minority rights, and conflict resolution. His scholarly work has been uh, compliment, uh, complemented by service as consult, consultant advisor to a number of intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, including the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and Department of Political Affairs. We are also joined by Nazha El Khalidi. Nazha is a Sahrawi journalist and activist. She is a member of Akip Media and is covering the human rights situation in Western Sahara. Eric Hagen is a board member of Western Sahara Resource Watch and director of the Norwegian Support Committee for Western Sahara. He has followed the matter of natural resources in Western Sahara for about 20 years and published a book about this topic in 2018. He has a background as an investigative journalist and geographer. I'll now turn it over to Izzy. Hi everyone, my name is Isabel Rosenbaum. I'm a senior and events coordinator at Merge. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'll give a brief overview of the structure of the panel. Each panelist will have about eight minutes to speak and present. We will start with Professor Zunes and then move to Professor Hanem, and then Nazhal Khalidi will speak, and then we'll have Eric Hagen. We will then have around 20 minutes or so for questions and answers. For all participants, you're very welcome to send questions at any point during the presentations, but all questions will be answered at the end. Also, please do not use the chat feature of your questions. Please use the Q&A, which you'll find on the same row on Zoom. And again, send the questions at any point and they'll be answered at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Zunes. Hello, uh, once again, my name is Steven Zunes. I'm at the University of San Francisco. And um, uh, for many years, I've been looking at the situation of Western Sahara, which is in, uh, the international community recognizes as a case of incomplete uh, decolonization. Um, that is a colony, a colony that's been denied its right of self-determination, which according to international law, uh, all uh, uh, colonized people have, they have a right right to, to do so. And um, the uh, uh, Western Sahara is a uh, uh, largely desert territory about the size of Colorado, immediately south of Morocco on the Atlantic coast. Uh, and this international consensus about its uh, uh, status uh, and the illegality of Morocco's uh, uh, invasion, occupation, and annexation of that territory was, was challenged uh, this past December when uh, uh, President Donald Trump uh, recognized uh, Morocco's illegal annexation. This is in direct defiance of a whole series of UN Security Council resolutions and landmark a world court ruling calling for self-determination. As with uh, Trump's earlier recognition of Israel's illegal annexation of Syria's Golan Heights, Trump, has effectively uh, tr Trump effectively renounced uh, the long-standing international legal principles uh, um, for self-determination in favor of the right of conquest. And the fact that Biden, despite being in office for, for a number of months now, and, and despite reversing a number of other troubling um, uh, actions uh, by the Trump administration, uh, has not rescinded this annexation. Uh, the maps at the US Embassy and Rabat still show Western Sahara as part of, of, of Morocco. And, uh, and, and uh, there's, there's 
little sign that uh, he will be reversing this soon. That, that could change depending on the political pressure. But this is very troubling because unlike the Golan, which is only a small part of a country, we're talking about the annexation of an, of an entire nation, which has been recognized as an independent state by no less than 80 countries. And since Western Sahara is a full member of the African Union, uh, the United States is essentially endorsing the conquest of of one recognized African state by another. And it was, pro it was the prohibition of such territorial conquests enshrined in the United Nations Charter, which the United States insisted had to be upheld by launching the Gulf War in 1991, reversing Iraq's conquest and illegal annexation of Kuwait. Now the United States is saying, well, having an Arab country invade, annex its small Southern neighbor is okay after all, at least if it's a, a US ally. Um, the Charter of the African Union, and prior to that, the um, uh, Organization for African Unity was quite explicit in saying no matter how arbitrary colonial boundaries may be, they cannot be changed with, without mutual agreement. But now, thanks to the U.S. recognition, uh, African countries with irredentist uh, ambitions know that they, they can have the support of the most powerful nation in the world should they uh, choose to do so. I should note though, that while the exact boundaries of Western Sahara are somewhat arbitrary, the Sahrawis are distinct from most Moroccans in terms of their dialect, uh, their dress, their food, uh, the, the role of women, uh, which is much more progressive than in, in Morocco. Um, the, um, the current um, US position is that Morocco's so-called autonomy plan for the territory is serious, credible, and realistic. And in Trump's word, it's the only basis for a just and lasting solution, even though it falls way short of the international legal definition of autonomy and would simply continue the occupation. Um, human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and other human rights uh, groups have documented widespread suppression by Moroccan occupation forces of uh, peaceful advocates of independence, uh, raising serious questions as to how genuine such autonomy under the kingdom would actually be. Indeed, Freedom House in the report that was released just a few weeks ago uh, listed Western Sahara as one of the half dozen least free countries in the world, um, you know, featuring a lack of rights on par with, 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 with I mean, with, with countries like North Korea uh, and and Uzbekistan, <laughs> and, and I mean, yeah, this is this is a, a, a an incredibly repressive country. Indeed, I, I've been to over 85 countries at this point, including Iraq under Saddam and Indonesia and Saharto. I've never seen a worse police state. Uh, than uh, Moroccan occupied Western uh, Sahara. And this autonomy proposal does not meet the legal definition of, of autonomy under international law. It's, it's vague to what extent there'd be genuine autonomy. And given all the promises Morocco's you know, violated over the past uh, 50 years, um, it, it, it's, it's really, it, it is, um, is doubtful they would actually go, go through with it. But, but more fundamentally, the autonomy plan rules out the option of independence. I mean, if in a free and fair referendum, the Sahrawis decide they prefer autonomy, that's fine. However, as an internationally recognized non-self-governing territory, international law is quite explicit that independence must be an option. And if, if the UN accepts the autonomy plan, um, you know, it would be the first time since the signing, uh, which the United States has been pushing them to do so, it would be the first time since signing the UN Charter, with the possible exception of West Papua, that the international community would recognize an incomplete um, um, de decolonization. But Morocco has seen, the uh, United States has seen Morocco as an important uh, regional ally, um, initially during the Cold War, uh, and, 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 and the struggle against communist and left-leaning nationalist governments, and subsequently in the fight of um, uh, Islamist extremists. And throughout this time, the U.S. has been willing to overlook uh, the legal and moral imperatives. Uh, the Polisario Front, the National Liberation Movement for Western Sahara, meanwhile, has counted primarily on the support of African, Latin American, and other countries of the, um, of the global south. Um, so the majority of, of, of the world really is on the side of self-determination, but the, the French and American veto threats at the UN Security Council have stymied efforts to place Western Sahara 
you know, under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, which would give the international community the power to impose sanctions or other appropriate leverage on Morocco to force the country uh, to abide by the UN mandates it has to date disregarded. Now, um, you know, there has been bipartisan support in Congress you know, for the um, uh, occupation. There's also been uh, bipartisan um, uh, opposition. Uh, though, though Trump sent, uh, you know, went, went this dangerous step of, um, of formally recognizing the annexation, the U.S. has been quietly supporting it for, for many years under both Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, I mean, and similarly, I mean, is the uh, uh, analogy with Israeli occupation of the West Bank uh, is uh, Trump w went out and essentially and, and recognized the annexation of these illegal settlements and, and the like. But, but we know that previously uh, the United States was essentially supporting the occupation anyway by blocking the UN from from enforcing resolutions, providing unconditional um, you know, military aid, and, and instead pushing this ongoing peace process uh, be, uh, between uh, where the occupying power clearly has the leverage over the ones under ocu occupation, and um, it, which, which has allowed the occupiers to continue colonizing the occupied territories and consolidating their, their control. Indeed, the, the Morocco has sent in settlers to Western Sahara to the point that they, they now outnumber the indigenous population. Um, this has made the ongoing nonviolent struggle uh, in the occupied uh, uh, territories more difficult. I, I'm a big believer in the power of strategic nonviolent action, but um, you know, when um, foreigners are in your land um, you know, and, and, and control most of the things, you know, the possibility of, of, of general strikes and other kinds of effective nonviolent resistance um, uh, are, are hard to, to um, uh, um, keep up. The Palisario resumed the armed struggle just a, a few months ago, given the lack of, of, the, of, the, of progress in the peace and the peace process and the um, <clears throat> failure of the international community uh, to um, to live up uh, to its uh, obligation. But I don't think the armed struggle is going to work either. Um, uh, again, given the, the, the uh, military superiority of the United uh, of, of the Moroccans and their foreign backers. That's why I think the real hope, the only hope really for um, the uh, to defend the post-World War II international legal order <laughs> that is to, that allows that says uh, expanding territories by force is wrong and we need to um, and you need to right, recognize the right of self-determination. It was if global civil society mobilizes, as we did against the Indonesian occupation of East Timor, or the South Af apartheid South Africa's occupation of Namibia. There, when there was when there was uh, campaigns of boycotts, divestment, and sanctions, and other pressure, essentially to shame our governments that are backing the occupiers from ending the occupation. That I think is the only real hope uh, that there will be justice and uh, and and peace in Western Sahara. Great, thank you, Professor Zunis. And now we'd like to move to Professor Hannan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very often in these sorts of panels, I'm the dissenting voice that tries to correct what others have said, but I'm happy to say that in this case, uh, Professor Nunes did uh, a very good job of summarizing the uh, international legal aspects of the situation. Self-determination can be an incredibly complicated issue because people read the words all peoples have the right to self-determination and they apply it to almost every group that wants to govern itself but the one thing that is clear that self-determination does mean despite that broad language is the right of former european colonies to be independent that was what the era, era of decolonization was all about that's a right that has been proclaimed and accepted, as Professor Nunez said, uh, by everyone, although sometimes more quietly than other times. Clearly, uh, that was not the case. Uh, after Spain abandoned Western Sahara, Morocco and Mauritania partitioned it for a while, and after that and after a war, uh, Morocco, which Morocco won by building a giant sand wall, a berm, uh, excluding about a quarter of the territory and taking the other three quarters to be part of Morocco, uh, that clearly didn't happen. 
in the case of Western Sahara. Uh, I was legal advisor to former US Secretary of State James Baker for a couple of years in 2002, 2003, when he was preparing what is, I think, the date still the most reasonable peace plan uh, for Western Sahara that was ultimately accepted at least as a basis of negotiation by Polisario, by the Sahrawi people, um, and rejected by Morocco. The key to that plan was the recognition of the right of Western Sahara to be independent. Not the obligation to be independent, uh, but the right to have that as one of the options. And what the plan attempted to do was to balance that right, which was only a possibility because it was subject to a referendum, with various other inducements for Morocco uh, to think that they might have a chance of winning such a referendum. One of the problems in Western Sahara has always been, because a referendum was always envisioned, who can vote in the referendum? And so the peace plan adopted a fairly expansive view of who could vote. The peace plan also suggested that the world would recognize an interim autonomy and the right of Morocco to control foreign relations and security during that time prior to the envisioned referendum. How could Morocco possibly object to these things? Um, let me suggest uh, the, the two ways which, in which they've tried. Uh, and in both cases, I think they failed. The first was to follow in the steps of India and China and Russia and, uh, well, not so much Kosovo, but in claiming that Western Sahara had always been a part of Morocco. And it was simply stolen from Morocco by Spain and therefore to be, should be returned to it in the same way that Macau and Hong Kong should have been returned and have been returned to China. Um, Goa was invaded by India and no one objected very strongly. The problem with that argument is that the General Assembly way back in 1974, right after Spain announced its intention to withdraw from its colony, it asked the International Court of Justice, the World Court, what the legal relationship was between Western Sahara and Morocco. And the court's uh, decision was very clear and almost unanimous. And let me just read you one of the final sentences of, of the court's opinion. It said, the court's conclusion is that the materials and information presented to it do not establish any tie of territorial sovereignty between the territory of Western Sahara and the Kingdom of Morocco or the Mauritanian entity. Thus, the court has not found legal ties of such a nature as might affect the decolonization of Western Sahara and in particular of the principle of self-determination through the free and genuine expression of the will of the peoples of the territory. So the court rejected um, Morocco's argument that Western Sahara had been a part of Morocco and should have returned. The other Moroccan position, which is the one it has adopted now, is that there is an alternative to independence, and that is whatever is freely agreed to by the two parties. And, that, and they're clearly accurate about that. Uh, in addition to perhaps uh, Western Papua, uh, there's the case of Nui that is uh, freely associated with Australia. The case of Puerto Rico in the United States is another example where the UN uh, has approved such arrangements short of independence or short of full integration. And so autonomy is a perfectly viable alternative, so long as it's with the free consent of both parties. And of course, if your territory has been occupied for, what is it now, almost 50 years, um, that's not exactly, those are not exactly the conditions under which free consent can be given. Well, then what happened to the UN when, uh, because the UN has never formally rejected this notion that every colony has the right to be independent. Uh, when it received uh, the, re the proposal of Secretary Baker and this peace plan that envis envisaged a referendum on independence, uh, it described uh, the, uh, it, its conclusions as 
that it strongly supports the efforts of the Secretary General, supports the peace plan for self-determination of the people of Western Sahara, and this is the key, as an optimum political solution on the basis of agreement between the two parties. So unlike every other colonial situation, or almost everyone, where independence was the default solution, didn't require a referendum of any kind. Ever since 1975, the UN Security Council has introduced this additional element, which is an oxymoron in and of itself, that self-determination should be conditioned on the agreement of Morocco and the agreement of the people of uh, Western Sahara. Since that time, nothing has been achieved through decades of personal envoys and other attempts at achieving an agreed upon solution. And I wish I could be as optimistic uh, as Professor Nunes that either sanctions or pressure could work in, that ca in this case. But I think it's extremely unlikely, certainly without a greater commitment uh, of both the Sahrawi and the Moroccans to finding a solution that would actually leave them both better off. This might in fact be autonomy within Morocco. Uh, I am not one who would trust the Moroccan government to a great extent, uh, but one of the attempts in the peace plan was to have a five year period where Morocco would have a certain degree of control to give them a chance to show the people of Western Sahara that they might be better off in a Morocco with a great degree of self-government. Unfortunately, that looks like it's unlikely to happen. Uh, if the armed conflict uh, increases, if uh, the Polisario, the Sahrawi uh, leadership uh, decide to engage in terrorist acts within Morocco, then the Sahrawis will be certain to lose because terrorism, in addition to a, uh, an economic outlook that is similar to that of the United States is the real reason, in my view, uh, that the US has been so friendly uh, with Morocco, which since 2001, coincidentally only two years before the Baker Plan, has been one of our few allies in North Africa on the question of terrorism. Uh, we can talk about other possible ways forward so the stalemate doesn't continue indefinitely, but there has been no UN representative dealing directly with Western Sahara for the last two years since the last one resigned. And so it's very difficult uh, these days to find much space for any movement in the situation. And that's a very sad conclusion to have to reach, but I will, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now I'd like to turn to Nesha, please. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, panel. So uh, my name is Nassar uh, Khalidi. I'm uh, a part of uh, Equip Media. It's a group of media activists who are working on documentation, the violation that is committed uh, to the Moroccan uh, occupying forces against Sahrawi uh, uh, people in the Iqbal territory. I'm based uh, in Layoun, uh, the, uh, the capital of Western Sahara. And uh, I would like to share like what we lived and what we witnessed uh, in our country. So um, uh, since Morocco invaded the territory in 1975, um, was imposing and still imposing a totally media and military blockade. There are so many like uh, crimes against humanity that is committed to the occupation against Sahrawis. Morocco killed so many people during the invasion and after the invasion. Uh, Morocco kidnapped people for many, many years, uh, killed them, uh, them and the tortured, and nobody talked about these uh, crimes. So you can imagine from the 70s till 2009, when uh, we, we established our uh, group um, Equip Media that is called Equip Media. It's an organization, but you might think 
that uh, it's an organization with an office and uh, like it's a real organization. But no, uh, Ekipmedia, we are just uh, people. If you want uh, to have a, a small meeting or normal meeting, simple meeting, we have to um, arrange it clandestinely without letting the Moroccan um, authorities know because they will surround our houses and arrest uh, all the members of um, uh, our organization. And by the way, all the members of our organization are former political prisoners. All of them have experienced the torture. And uh, of course we know why, uh, because Morocco doesn't want uh, any voice to be out uh, from this territory that is closed for, for many, many years. No press agencies in the ground, no uh, international organization that working on documentation and Morocco is doing whatever um, they want. It wasn't like uh, easy for us to uh, uh, like pass through uh, a decade, almost a decade. We were working since like to now 10 years of uh, a work. Uh, we had so many difficulties inside and outside since we uh, started to build like a network with uh, organization that can take the information from us and use our reports um, and to be like um, uh, a reliable resource for them. It wasn't easy because all the time we face the French uh, lobby and of course the Moroccan uh, propaganda uh, outside and so many unfortunately uh, organization and activists and uh, like uh, politicians are uh, very supportive to the occupation and uh, like just uh, the occupation influence on them very easily so they can take a step back. They start working with us but then they just uh, withdraw without any uh, reasons unfortunately. So it wasn't easy. But we managed uh, to, to bring so many also um, people who believe in humanity to work together with us. And we uh, build a network and now we have a small space in uh, very important like newspapers outside. And uh, uh, we have like a space in also some like uh, organization that take uh, the information we give them. Here, uh, unfortunately, uh, the only like information that can be taken uh, for us uh, easily, and I will explain how it is easy for us, just documenting the protests in the streets, but it's not easy. We cannot take the cameras in the ground. We have to find like a place is surrounded, the place where the event is taking place and uh, be in high, uh, the, these buildings in uh, rooftops and filming hiding the cameras and trying to um, like be very careful uh, to avoid uh, to be arrested and the, the materials be confiscated by uh, the police. Uh, if we want to do like more investigations, for example, regarding the natural resources, and we know that we pay the price of uh, like being um, or living or being a, um, yani, a people who, ha uh, who is living in a land that is, uh, that is considered as a, one of the richest country in the world. And because of that, we are under the occupation and now, and we are a victim of uh, international conspiracy, uh, unfortunately. So if we want to do this kind of investigation, we cannot go, for example, to the companies um, that is exploiting our natural resources illegally. We cannot meet these people. We cannot be close to the area all the workers in these companies are Moroccans. The Sahrawi are not allowed to work uh, in uh, in this kind of work and taking like being in this kind of position of work uh, because they are afraid. The Moroccans are afraid from them to have like a sensitive information that can help to expose the Moroccan illegal um, exploitation of our natural resources and the uh, foreign companies that stealing our natural resources. If we want to do investigation regarding like the political prisoners, when we are not able to get information from the trials uh, because we are activists and we are already criminalized uh, by the occupation and we are in the blacklist. So our move is really, really very limited. Uh, we cannot move and this is uh, affect our work a lot. This is uh, affect the information we give to the people outside. That's why we call for 
um, a natural side to be here, natural organization, natural press agency to be here to document. And Morocco is refusing this because they know the importance and the power of the, uh, the of course, and the voice of the uh, picture. Uh, Morocco is still in spreading uh, still spreading uh, the fake information about the will of the Sahrawi people. All Sahrawi are supporting the independence. And if we are talking about or asking why Morocco is refusing the self-determination, the answer is really is very clear because Morocco understand and know that nobody in Western Sahara accept to be controlled by the Moroccan occupation because we live uh, without dignity. We live with, with, with insult. And if we just speak one word, we are going to face jail. We are going to fa to be in the custody. And I'm here I'm not talking about something like uh, that I've, I've never witnessed. I've been arrested several times. I'm a victim of torture. When I was 13 years old, I spent seven hours and they're tortured. I was arrested in 2016. I was arrested in 2018. I was subjected to a media defamation, Moroccan police stealing my phone, publishing badly about me, my personal picture, my, my photos, just to, to stop my work. And uh, so you can understand how is the situation for Sahrawi. And uh, just to explain, I mean, I mean to share with you, uh, like it's, we are not safe. We now we are trying to protect ourselves, especially after the the, the outbreak of the war in in, two, in uh, 13th of November, after Morocco violated the the ceasefire and they the Morocco violated the ceasefire after a peaceful protest who came from the refugee camps to protest against a gap that is built illegally in a wall that is also a, a humanitarian car or a crime against humanity that divide our country and our, our our people that has more than 10 million land mines and that affect the people we know you know that we are nomadic people and the people are like moving outside of the city every time we hear about the people who died because of that mines that is built by Morocco uh, together with uh, the other countries who are already involved uh, in this uh, dirty with this uh, I mean uh, game with Morocco in these dirty policies like United States and uh, France and Saudi Arabia and uh, the others uh, countries so uh, this gap it was illegally into it was uh, i mean exploited or morocco was benefited from it by transportation of natural resources to the africa and we are asking how this can be convinced i mean to the people that morocco is already building this wall and building this gap without nobody saying any words uh, in the like regarding the the ceasefire agreements, there were only four gaps in the wall that allow the, the United Nations to move, but not this gap, not El Gargaret. And Morocco uh, targeted these protest, uh, protesters. And of course, the Polisario had the responsibility to uh, save the lives of these protesters. And that's why they restart the war, unfortunately. We don't support any violence, but all the people in Western Sahara are really happy with this new path. And I really trust uh, Polisario now after they raise their weapons. And we, 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 we feel so sorry that uh, the things goes like that uh, after being like uh, waiting for many, many years for a peaceful solution since uh, 1991, 30 years and just betrayed. Uh, by the international community. And now uh, we had the recognition from the United States, Trump recognition, that really uh, disappointed for, for, for us. But of course, Sahrawi people believe in their uh, fear, fear rights and fear case. And of course, they will continue the struggle. And we are exist in our country. Nobody can just throw out uh, the people of Western Sahara from the map. Uh, or from the earth we are exist uh, it take time morocco's like playing to to exploit more the natural resources and uh, i mean uh, uh, benefit from uh, the, the 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 ongoing uh, i mean the conflict being like a, a prolonged conflict but still the people uh, for over now 40 years still have the same demands the independence and nothing uh, except the independence thank you very much Thank you so much, Nessa, for sharing your experiences.
Um, now we'd like to move to Eric Hagen from Western Sahara Research Watch. And Eric, if you have something you'd like to screen share, you should be able to do that right now. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll be fine without screen sharing. We'll do it like this. Um, so uh, our association, uh, a Brussels-based uh, international association, we um, monitor the um, exploration, exploitation, exports of natural resources from Western Sahara to markets uh, overseas. Um, the, uh, the work is based basically on, again, on the principle of self-determination. That principle is very clear when it comes to non-self-governing territories and choosing their political future, but it also applies to um, the people of a non-self-governing territory to uh, manage their own resources. There's also another uh, set of, of international law regarding laws of occupation, what, what, what rights an occupying power has on occupied land and, and obligations they have. Within this framework, we, um, uh, we uh, document those um, incidents, uh, shipments, agreements that violate the right to self-determination or, or, or over these resources. There's been a, an incredible development on this front since we started in 2005. Uh, the last, uh, since 2015, um, there have been four consecutive decisions made by the Court of Justice of the European Union, um, underlining that Morocco, just like the Court of Justice, which was mentioned by the International Court of Justice, underlining that Morocco and Western Sahara are separate and distinct territories, and any trade agreement by the United by the European Union with Morocco cannot apply to Western Sahara, unless unless the people has accepted it, unless there has been a, a recognition, a consent given by, uh, by Western Sahara. This principle uh, also applies to, to private businesses. They have to respect this, this, uh, this principle. So our work consists in challenging, writing to these companies involved and um, uh, ask whether they have sought, obtained these, this consent. It's a, it's a very technical work. Uh, our website, uh, Western Star Resource Watch website, um, details everything that I'm saying now. There are several resources that are fundamental in understanding the Western Star conflict and how it develops. Uh, the, the first aspect is the phosphate trade. Phosphates was a very important um, uh, commodity uh, to understand also what happened in 1975. Morocco took very quickly control over the phosphate mines. Uh, started exports. Uh, United States, uh, let me uh, have a little uh, emphasis on the US role uh, since this is a, a US initiative, this panel. Uh, United States uh, remained from, I think already from the early 80s, um, Louisiana uh, in the South States uh, became very important in imports of phosphate rock for fertilizer production for the agriculture sector. Um, this trade, by the end of um, 2018, the American-Canadian trade, controlled by the same company, constituted 50% of the phosphate imports. And that, that stopped in December 2018. So since then, uh, there has been no North American involvement, which is very, very good news. The, um, the importers... Uh, uh, make reference to corporate responsibility when stopping the trade. Um, there have been uh, two different uh, U.S. importers uh, in the recent years. The importer in Florida uh, has specifically stated that we'd stopped because of the human rights concern in Western Sahara. So there has been a, a set of responsible companies that found a way around this dilemma. Uh, this has basically cut the exports in half. So what used to be around 2 million tons of phosphate export is now down to 1 million tons. This is, um, this is analyzed, this, we see this based on the size and the number of shipments. So we analyze basically the, 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 the traffic. There are still some US involvement in this industry. Uh, there, there are a set of different law firms or, or audit firms in the United States that uh, give uh, legal advice and different sorts of advice to the Moroccan exporter on the ground. These documents, these opinions are always confidential. Uh, we do not know how they're made. Uh, they, they are supposedly also defending 
everything why this is legal, including why this is to the benefit of the local population and everything relating to, to the understanding of, of this is something that they actually want. But none of these opinions are public. We don't know the methodology, how they have assessed the status of the land, how they have assessed the status of Morocco on the land. Um, none of these reports have been shared with the Sahrawi people, yet they claim to support the Sahrawi people. So this is, of course, a paradox. And these reports written by these US law firms or, or, or due diligence companies are fundamentally complicated in, in that they uh, legitimize, they greenwash, uh, the, um, or they, 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 uh, they give a, a good impression to the whole industry. Um, there used to be a very strong um, participation, regretfully, of American oil companies in Western Sahara. Uh, that stopped in 2000, and it must have been 2015, 16, 16 I think. Um, Oklahoma, Texas-based companies, um, it has been going on since 2002 to 2015. Now they are out. Um, this caused a lot of protests from the Sahrawis, um, both in the refugee camps and in the occupied territories, and finally they pulled out. What we then, instead of uh, that, we have um, a concerning development on the renewable front. The Sahrawis and ourselves, we were always very scared about what might happen to the dynamics of the conflict if, um, uh, if Morocco finds oil in Western Sahara. Luckily, they didn't for the conflict. But what happened in the meantime, from 2012, is that Morocco built large, started the construction of large renewable energy uh, production in Western Sahara, both solar and um, wind. Um, this is growing very, very quickly. And there are many complicated aspects of that. One is that it ties Morocco through these electricity cables to Western Sahara, making Morocco depending on energy production in Western Sahara. Second, it will probably in the future make the European Union depending on energy production in Western Sahara. Thirdly, these are uh, companies owned by the Moroccan king doing it in partnership with European companies. It means that the king as a person becomes more involved in Western Sahara, which is also not good. And also it gives this impression of, of, uh, of a Moroccan government being ethical and having a constructive approach to this, which they do not. Uh, the, the wind energy is also used for quite controversial businesses, like uh, the energy, 100% of the energy needed for the phosphate exports, where the phosphate mineral is just depleted from the territory, that comes from windmills. So it has this extra effect. Um, there's one um, huge uh, plan going on of a US company called Soluna, uh, which is going to build a massive wind farm in a southern part of the territory uh, for the mining of bitcoins or the e-mining, e which is an absurd idea to begin with. Um, but uh, this is, is a controversial and it is, um, it is quickly developing and we need to see this stop. Um, so all in all, uh, and then of course, the most important resource are the fisheries. The fish products are, um, this is one of the richest fish, fishing coasts of the world. Um, there are, the fish are exported in different ways, like oil or, or, um, or fish meal. Uh, those are the most valuable probably due to the volume of it, but also canned and frozen fish. Some of it ends up in Europe, uh, Germany, France, uh, and some ends up in West Africa, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Nigeria, um, populated West African countries. Um, some also probably ends up in the United States. Uh, we're not 100% sure about those trade routes, but there might be. Um, and some end up in Asia. Uh, this is, this is a large, uh, the largest industry that also employs many settlers. Now, the interesting point is that the European Union, um, the EU-Moroccan trade agreements, which include, they've always been including Western Sahara in violation of international law, according to the EU court itself, um, the EU institutions politically, ha they have been overruling the, these judgments, ignoring them, and instead signing new agreements. Now, uh, we will see a very interesting development happening now, probably at one point during the summer, in which the Court of Justice of the EU, again, will come with a new statement on EU Moroccan trade, um, where we hopefully will see a clarification in terms of, of the international uh, law applicable and that Western Sahara cannot be included in further trade agreements. Thank you so much. I've uh, spoken enough. All these aspects are found on our website, including the technical details of these companies. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much to all the panelists for presenting their experiences and work and ideas. We have a few questions um, that I will read from the q and I'll just go one by one for time. So one of our first questions are, is there a possibility for the US's recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara to be used to call for a referendum on independence whose outcome Morocco would then have to respect? Is this more likely than Biden completely reversing the policy? Whoever would like to take the question is welcome to just unmute. I mean, I'm, I'm, I would be willing to start at least. The problem is that there's no real international community out there. Even though we like to refer to it as frequently as possible. The problem here is the UN Security Council. Uh, and the EU and others. The, the work that Eric has described is extremely important, but it's by definition almost not political. It's, it's trying to identify better businesses that, than there are states. Nobody wants to cross the United, the United States right now. I would hope that Biden would reverse uh, this decision that, uh, that Trump made. But the best that the Security Council can do, I think, is to reassert what is, I thought, but perhaps I'm wrong, still the law of self-determination, which is that the people of Western Sahara have the right to decide, whether through a referendum or any other way, whether or not they want to be independent. That would then make it easier, at least for individual states or perhaps the EU to begin to, uh, to impose sanctions on Morocco, which are rarely successful, but sometimes work. Um, and it would at least make it more difficult for countries to continue to exploit the resources of Western Sahara. And that may be the real opening that we could see here. Uh, nothing, frankly, that is done in a formal way will change the mind of Morocco at the moment. It would be impossible to hold a referendum in Western Sahara hot. Uh, Western Sahara without the cooperation of the Moroccan government. Uh, and so in and of itself, I think a referendum is, is not on the table and we need to pursue the other ways of trying to undo what Trump did, but also ensure, as I think another question referred to, that this isn't followed by other states doing the same thing. Uh, Western Sahara is a member of the African Union the African Union still officially supports its independence. And most of the members, although not all, recognize that independence formally. Uh, they've been extremely quiet. And it would seem to me that that's the place to start. One also might go on and say, and approach any organization that is uncomfortable with Israel exporting products from Palestine. One of the th only things you can do to enrage almost everyone in the UN is to recreate the situation of Palestinians with the situation of the Sahrawis. To me, they're more than a little alike. Uh, and it's uncomfortable for third world countries in particular to support independence for Palestine uh, vocally and to, be remain, to remain silent in supporting independence for Western Sahara. That's not easy to change because there's nothing in their direct interest, but perhaps the economic possibilities that Eric has described um, will lead to some countries at least paying more attention to this. I, I would quickly add that um, you know, the United States has been very clear that um, Russia's annexa annexation of Crimea is illegal and we are perfectly willing to put sanctions on, on Russia. There's no reason we shouldn't do that uh, in the rest of the international community vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Morocco uh, as well. I, I do believe that a, a referendum is still possible. I believe it's really the only option if, if, if in terms of an act of self-determination, but let's remember how East Timor seemed like a hopeless cause back in the mid 1990s but it was a global civil society mobilized in such a way that it forced the governments that were backing indonesia's occupation primarily the united states britain australia and canada to um to stop their support and uh and 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 forced 
um, in East, uh, the Indonesians to allow for a referendum, which the people overwhelmingly vote for independence, as I think most observers would say the people of Western Sahara would do. So I really do think it's up to um, a global civil society to 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 mobilize and and to and to push this, whether it be by targeting uh, corporations that are, are taking uh, taking advantage of this, or going after our uh, our own 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 government uh, in in this way, pointing out the double standards we have about Kuwait and Crimea, for example, um, and 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 recognizing that uh, U.S. leadership. I mean, you, you know, people are really concerned about Russian forces on the border of Ukraine. You know, what if the Russia does try to annex even even more of Ukraine. Can the United States, uh, you know, say, oh, we we support the right of self-determination. You cannot expand your territory by force. Really? Can we do that while we still recognize Morocco's annexation of Western Sahara? Uh, no way. I mean, we, we, U.S. leadership is at stake here. And I think these kinds of arguments, you know, if, if the moral ones and the legal ones don't don't, don't uh, make make much headway to these politicians, and perhaps you know the the the, the more pragmatic ones um, ones will. Um, and and just uh, just and, and also just the idea of the United States we go on and on says why can't the the these Arab uh, Arab uh, Arab peoples have more d d democracy and be more secular and not uh, not so Islamist why don't re recognize the rights of 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 of, of, of women etc cetera, etc cetera. well the, that that that's what the uh, Western Sahara have been doing with their government exile the probably Arab Democratic Republic and in the liberated territories that's what the people are struggling inside instead we're supporting this repressive right-wing monarchy and you know it is it is um uh, again this is putting our whole you know, the reasons we talk about why we have to be in the middle east to support democracy and stop is yeah, i mean i mean again there's so many areas where the western sahara is, is a real black eye to the u.s and its res reputation its broader policy goals i think we can really uh, we push these uh, this angle as well Great, thank you. And we have a question kind of pertaining more to activism, which is, do changes in the US's or other countries' foreign policy towards Western Sahara affect the landscape of Sahrawi activism and strategies used? I don't know if perhaps- Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think that this recognition is really, um, it gave uh, the green uh, light to the occupation to to arrest more people. And actually they say it loudly in some, um, like the, um, uh, some declaration and announcements in the social media, uh, in the fake accounts and some also official accounts saying that now we had the recognition from the powerful country and state in the, in the world. So uh, nobody now will, will, will take Sahara or will, will just, uh, I mean, uh, stand against the, what they call it Moroccan unity uh, again. So this is really make the people and the risk more in, in Western Sahara. We understand that this recognition is only for this, uh, the sake of normalization. And I mean, uh, and it shows actually that United States in its deep doesn't recognize uh, the Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. And it's, this recognition's uh, purpose is only to improve relations between Morocco and the, uh, Israel. But we don't care if Morocco wants to develop uh, their relations with any uh, country. We don't care. Uh, what we are against uh, um, it is, is like to, to, to be this relations to be built on our blood. And this is actually uh, what happened. The USA, uh, it's it's not like a normal state. It's a country that uh, laid uh, uh, the human rights around the world, and it has its reputation. And uh, if give the, like the the this illegal sovereignty to an occupying power, this means that these people will just, I mean, be uh, a victim uh, of a genocide. I think so. Unfortunately, we're really disappointed by we have this uh, little hop on the new uh, administration and hopefully that will change uh, this um, political position that is declared by uh, Trump. May I, may I come in a short comment on something? Yes, please do. 
Uh, just uh, something in relation to what uh, uh, Stephen Zunz said, um, like the parallel, if Russia had annexed a little bit more of Ukraine, what kind of arguments would then the UK or US have? And I think the situation is even worse because the United States did not only recognize the Moroccan sovereignty over the parts of Western Sahara that it currently controls. Morocco only controls three quarters of the territory. What the US did was to recognize the entire Western Sahara as there's no, there's no distinction between what Morocco currently occupies and what it doesn't. So by saying Western Sahara is part of Morocco would be saying like the entire Ukraine is part of Russia. Imagine the green light that Morocco might feel politically in, in just, okay, it's all ours. It, it is it's setting a dangerous signal to an escalation of the conflict in the same way it would have been if Russia had, uh, if the states have said the entirety of Ukraine is part of Russia. That is a very dangerous thing to say on the United States. So I, I, I'm deeply concerned about this. And from a European perspective, we are totally baffled and, and of course shocked. And, um, and um, Biden has little credibility on international law if it uh, fails to uh, correct Trump's uh, spectacular move. Great, thank you. We have one more question before we'll wrap up about one. Um, we had a question of Professor Hanami briefly addressed this. We had a question about with Moroccan rejoining the AU, the African Union, and trying to influence countries in Africa to end recognition for Western Sahara. How can Sahrawis maintain support from countries that have traditionally supported them in the AU? And I suppose we could also extend this question slightly to think more about Sahrawis building support and recognition from other in, from individual countries, both in the region and outside. Would anyone like to begin? Or I guess it's a bit of a broad question, but any aspect of it. Um. There has been, if I may say, um, just need to reflect a bit. Uh, there has been, ever since Morocco joined the African Union, not really returned to, because it was never really part of the African Union. It was part of the previous uh, organization. Uh, ever since Morocco joined the African Union, um, of course, the African institutions have been a, a battleground uh, between these two parties of the conflict. Um, I do not think there has been much shift in spite of, of the, of, of, um, uh, of the um, membership, the new membership of Morocco, there has been no real shift. I mean, uh, at least no special trends in relation to how it was in the past. So, some governments uh, change position from one government to the other, and then it returns to the one, the, the way it was before. So some of these governments have very shifting shifting positions on the conflict, going from one extreme to the other. Uh, but that does not necessarily have anything to do with the Moroccan seat in the, in the African Union, I think. Um, that's more on the bilateral level. Um, I think the decolonization is still within the generation we have now of African leaders. It's, it's very fresh in mind still. And uh, I don't think there's a big risk of a, of a massive AU change on the parliament or peace and security council level. Uh, I think it remains quite stable. And all, I mean, the three, the three larger countries in, the, in Africa, South Africa, Algeria and Nigeria, are still very much supportive to, to the Sahrawis, and, and that colors a lot the political um, organization. Great, thank you. If any of the other, would any of the other panelists like to comment or we can wrap up? I guess I'd like to say just thank you for having this uh, discussion at all. It's been very rare that uh, Western Sahara has uh, ever comes up. And um, 
So I and, and I've had very few, you know, despite this being one of my areas of expertise, it's been I've had few occasions to talk about. It, so I'm very very grateful for you you to to do this. But I, I think it also uh, I think it underscores uh, again just to connect make the connection to the, the Palestinian struggle for self determination, uh, which of course is a much better known issue. Also, of course, a very uh, divisive issue. And I, I think that if we the more we talk about Western Sahara, I think it will also help the Palestinian cause because I think it will it will underscore that this is not about ideology or country's right to right to exist or or, or whatever. Uh, this is about the right of self determination. This is about international law. This is about human rights. This is about maintaining the United Nations Charter. I mean, these are the universal um, issues that got me involved. You know, in Western Sahara and East Timor and Palestine, and and if you go back far enough, Namibia, and so I um, and and if, if we can't get something as as basic as um, whether or not a country has a right to invade, occupy, and colonize a weaker neighbor, if we can't resolve something like that, how are we going to, as an international community? address uh, the, the more uh, the more complicated <laughs> uh, issues and so um, again this is this again this uh, I, I obviously I'm involved in this in part of course because I care about the Sahrawi people but but more, even more than that I, I, I care about the post-world War II international legal system um, you know that uh, that uh, that is, is founded in, in international law and the United Nations Charter and this is what's at stake here if the uh, if Morocco gets away uh, with its uh, takeover of Western Sahara and the United States as a principal architect of the United Nations Charter, as a principal architect of the post-World War II international uh, legal order, if we are continue to support that, uh, it is going to be very bad, not just for the Sahrawis, but the rest of the world. I just wanted to join in, in thanking the organizers as well. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's too rare that we discuss Western Sahara. I also want to thank the those of you who actually said something nice about international law. Usually it seems to get in the way. And I think, unfortunately, that's also what more and more countries are thinking as well. But we did set up something in 1945 and subsequently that I think has made the world a better place. And the real danger is that now we're going back to the 19th century when strength was all that mattered. And whether it's Kosovo, and which was after all is quasi independent because of the use of force supported by almost all Europeans and Americans, or whether it's Western Sahara or whether it's, uh, it's, it's Palestine, hypocrisy has never died in international relations. We hope that law brings some sort of consistency but Western Sahara is unfortunately a paradigm of how difficult it is uh, to translate law into practice. And if this is a little step forward towards making people more aware of that dichotomy, then it's certainly worth doing. And, and I hope that you all keep doing it. Thank you both for, the, for those comments and thank you all for coming, all those of you who attended the panel today and of course to our panelists. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend to wherever you are. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.